So in this video, we are going to discuss how to classify chemical compounds. And to start off, we just need to review how to determine what type of element you have using the periodic table. So there are three main types of elements on the periodic table. We have metalloids, nonmetals, and metals. And then we split up the metals into main group metals and transition metals. So let's start with the metalloids. On the periodic table, the metalloids are very easy to find because they kind of are along a, we call a staircase in the periodic table. So if you start right here and you start drawing a staircase like this, just like this, up and down, your metalloids border the staircase, being boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, the antimony and polonium and tellurium. Uh, and you might notice that there is one element, aluminum, that borders the staircase that is not actually a metalloid. Aluminum is a main group metal. And so you just kind of have to remember that one there that is not a metalloid. So once you know where the metalloids are, it's very easy to find the non-metals. They are up and to the right of the metalloids. So our non-metals are over here on our periodic table. And then also we have to include hydrogen in that non-metal list. A hydrogen and helium kind of go together over here, so we can have hydrogen over here with the non-metals. And then last but not least, we have our metals. And the metals are by far the biggest group in the periodic table. Uh, everything to the left of this staircase, to the left of our metalloids, are our metals. And we have two groups of metals. We have our main group metals, which behave in very predictable ways and have uh, known charged states. And those are groups one and two of our periodic table. And then also... Uh, a group 13 right here, all these behave as main group metals. And then we have our transition metals, which are all these metals in the middle of the periodic table. And then also uh, tin and lead also behave as transition metals. So it's pretty easy to identify what element type you have, and it's a very important skill to be able to do when we are trying to uh, figure out what kind of bond will form and trying to name a compound appropriately. So next up, let's talk for a second about inter and intra. So next up, let's talk a little bit about the difference between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. Because these words sound very, very similar, but they're not the same thing at all. When we are talking about intermolecular forces, we are talking about forces that exist between molecules. And uh, you might have learned about something called hydrogen bonding in biology class. And hydrogen bonding is actually kind of a misnomer here because it is not an actual chemical bond. It is an intermolecular force, meaning it exists between more than one molecule. And where you probably talked about this is exist hydrogen bonding existing between more than one molecule of water. So intermolecular forces are between molecules, but we are, what we are primarily focused on in chemistry class are intramolecular forces, which are the forces that are within a molecule, meaning they hold the molecule together. And those are our chemical bonds, chemical bonds that we are going to talk about lots in this unit and throughout chemistry class. So there are two main types of intramolecular forces, meaning forces that are within a molecule. And those two main types are, are ionic bonds and covalent bonds. And the difference between these two bond types is what is happening with the electrons. Because 
As we've talked about before, the whole point of chemistry is to increase stability in nature, to increase stability in our molecules. And for something to be more stable, what makes an atom stable is having a full octet, meaning eight electrons. And so the difference in these two types of bondings uh, is how the, uh, the atoms are going about getting a full octet. So in an ionic bond, uh, one atom is actually taking, or sometimes we call this stealing, electrons from another molecule to reach a full octet. So as you can see here, we have a sodium atom, which has its one valence electron, and then we have a bromine atom, which has seven valence electrons. So sodium wants to lose that one electron to reach a full outer shell, and bromine, conveniently, wants to gain one electron to reach an outer shell. So sodium's going to lose its electron to bromine, and then we have two ions that form. We have a sodium ion with a plus one charge, and we have a bromine ion with a minus one charge. And so these two ions now have opposite charges, and what do we know about opposite charges? Well, opposites attract. So sodium and bromine are then attracted to each other because of that difference in charge, those opposite charges. So that is how an ionic bond forms. And these bonds typically form between metals and nonmetals because on our periodic table, our metals tend to form positively charged ions and our nonmetals tend to form negatively charged ions. Then over here we have covalent bonding, and covalent bonding may seem a little happier here because it's when atoms share electrons to obtain a full octet. So we have a carbon atom here in the middle with its four valence electrons that you can get from the periodic table, and then we have hydrogen atoms, each with one valence electron. Uh, and you can get that from the periodic table. And so carbon is going to share one electron with each hydrogen atom. So hydrogen can obtain its duet of electrons. And then carbon itself now is actually sharing eight electrons, which gives carbon an octet of electrons. So these covalent bonds, they typically form between all nonmetals. So that is how you can tell the difference between an ionic and a covalent bond. So finally, let's talk a little bit about how to determine uh, more specifically what type of compound we have. Because when you start looking at chemical naming, it's important to be able to know exactly what type of compound we have. Not just if it's ionic or covalent, but whether it's a simple ionic compound or a ternary ionic compound or a binary ionic compound, whether it contains a main group metal or a transition metal, whether it's covalent compound, whether it's an acid, there's all sorts of different naming conventions that we're going to need to learn to follow. So the first step in learning this is learning how to classify these things specifically. So you should have this chart on a piece of paper uh, in your unit folder. So go ahead and get that out and follow along with me so we can learn together how to use this resource. So let's look at this first example, NABR. So here's our compound, and the first thing that we need to decide in order to classify it is does it have a metal? Terry and Mac, please call 009. Terry Mac, 009, please. The first thing we need to decide is does it have a metal in it? So I'm looking at this, and the metal is always going to be our first element. So I'm going to look at sodium, and I'm going to use my periodic to the table to decide, is this a metal? So looking at my periodic table, sodium is in the group one of the periodic table. So yes, that is a metal. So does it have a metal? Yes. So I'm going to proceed this way in my flowchart. The next question I need to ask myself is, is it a main group metal or is it a transition metal? So once again, it's in group one. It's not in that middle part of the periodic table. So it is a main group metal, so I'm going to keep going along the main group path. The third question I need to ask is, does it have two elements or does it have more? And so looking at my compound, 
uh, it does indeed just have two types of elements. And that's really what I'm talking about here, not whether it has, it could have more than two elements, more than two atoms in it, but how many types of atoms does it have? And it has sodium and bromine. So two types of elements. So I'm going to proceed along that path. And that tells me that this is a simple binary ionic compound. And you might notice that it has a number one right here, which we're not too worried about right now. But that number one actually refers you to the correct naming rule, which is on your comprehensive guide to chemical naming. So when you start doing naming, that will be a help to you. So let's do a second example here. So following again, I have carbon and fluorine. So does it have a metal? So carbon uh, is all the way over in group 14. So that's not a metal. And then fluorine, just to double check, fluorine's in group 17 of the periodic table. So that is not a metal either. So no, this compound does not have a metal. Next question, is it an acid? And the way you'll tell if it's an acid is if the first element is hydrogen. The first element is not hydrogen here. It is carbon. So this is not an acid. So we're going to keep going. Are there two elements, two types of elements or more? So we have carbon and we have fluorine. That's only two types of elements. So we're going to go two elements. And that brings us to binary covalent, which is naming rule number five. Next example here, we have BE3PO4 with a 2 outside the parentheses. So that looks a little more complicated, but I can still just follow my chart here. So does it have a metal? Beryllium, BE, uh, that is in group 2 of the periodic table. Yes, it has a metal. Um, is it a main group metal or is it a transition metal? Beryllium being in group 2, that would be a main group metal. Does it have two elements or does it have more? So in this compound, I have beryllium. That's one type of element. I have phosphorus. That's a second type of element. And I also have oxygen. So I have more than two types of elements, which brings me to it being a ternary ionic compound, naming rule number 3. And then our final example, H3PO4. So starting over again, does it have a metal? A hydrogen, we remember we said that is not a metal, it's a non-metal. And then phosphorus is also a non-metal. Oxygen is a non-metal. So there are no metals in this compound. So I'm going to go no. Is it an acid? Meaning, is the first element hydrogen? Well, yes, this compound, the first element in it is hydrogen. So yes, this is an acid. So then my next question, are there two elements or more? So here we have hydrogen, we have phosphorus, and we have oxygen. So there are three different types of elements. I'm going to say more than two types of elements. So this is a ternary acid. So you can do this over and over again. And you'll start out by using this flowchart, but the goal is that eventually you are able to classify these compounds without using this chart. So uh, as you go through the practice sheet, as you go through your classifying compounds practice sheet, start out by using the chart, but then towards the end, start trying to ask yourself these questions without using your chart so that you know that you have mastered classifying chemical compounds. Thank mm -hmm.